Hey, you know what? I've been meaning to talk to you about something. I'm thinking about getting a bike. Come on, come on, come on. I have something really important I want oh. to show you. Come on, let's oh, go. Honey. I mean, you're going to be excited. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah, Are yeah. You sure? Yeah. going on. What's the matter, honey? You're usually such a stud muffin. What is it? I don't know. It's... When I'm on that bike, I'm all aroused. I get off and... Forget it. Limp. It's all over with. I knew it was a bad idea buying that bicycle. Don't worry, baby. We'll, uh, we're gonna shine you up tonight. We'll have you ready in no time. Hi, Sherry. It's me, Angie. I need to talk to you right away. I'm really worried about Steve. He's acting like a nutcase. Last night in the middle of the night, he started like moving his legs like he was pedaling his bicycle and he kept like kicking me and I told him to stop and he just kept going and, and, and every single day lately, all he eats is round things and he like rolls them around the table like a bicycle and he's, he's acting like a little thing and I'm... Yeah, guess what? I think she's a little jealous. She saw me with her yesterday. Who's your daddy? That's right. Come on now. What does she look like? She's black. I was riding her all day yesterday. God, she is fast, easy, smooth. Man, I couldn't get enough. <laughs> well, listen, I gotta get going. I gotta pick her up. She's over at the bike shop. Getting a tune-up. Wish I could be giving her a tune-up, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Dov'è la mia bicicletta? Sempre la bicicletta! Sempre la bicicletta! Ma mi piace la bicicletta! Odio la bicicletta! Odio la bicicletta! I love my helmet. It protects my cranium from substantial harm. Don't want to wear one? Be prepared to get hurt bad and not recover. Hey everybody, it's Sharon from Bike TV and today we took a little excursion in the town of Pittsford, New York. Uh, just outside of Rochester and it's a very lovely little town and it's also uh, home to the very famous Erie Canal. was you know an engineering marvel finished in 1825 it was a project of our own uh, Al Smith from New York City who was governor of New York at the time and um, while there's no more barge traffic basically on the canal there's lots of recreational traffic so you can get a kayak and take it out you can take uh, tours on boats and of course you can ride your bike and that's what we did today So we went out, we went to Towpath Bikes and we rented bikes for a couple hours. Uh, we got these cruisers that were um, adequate, they were fine to ride. Uh, and actually a cruiser or a hybrid is what you want to rent when you're up here along the path because there's many different kinds of pavements. There's you know, your regular asphalt but then there's uh, hard packed cinders, there's some 
short periods where there's heavy rocks and um, then there's also when you're going through some of the towns where it becomes more a pedestrian area um, it, it's kind of like a brick surface um, cobblestones you might even want to say so the best way to get around is using a bike that you know that can go on many different kinds of surfaces and folks let's face it when you're out here on the the, the canal you're not going to be going very fast 10 miles an hour tops uh, there's so much to see the canal is just absolutely beautiful uh, there's boats and uh, kayakers going up and down the path and also a lot of uh, walkers runners joggers we saw uh, a uh, physically challenged gentleman in his wheelchair using ski poles and that was pretty impressive today too you'll probably find at any canal but are in great abundance here of course are bridges over the over the canal um, many of them are uh, one-lane bridges so you have to be very patient and wait your turn um, others go up and down to let the boats through on the canal like up like an elevator it's very cool to watch and there's also um, locks which um, I know there are some non-working but we saw a working one today lock 32 it was actually part of a New York State Park called Canal Park and you can see the boats raise, get raised on the water in order to make continue their journey. You are watching Bike TV your number one source for cycling news and information. To learn more about the show, please visit our website at www.biketv.org. It's not a weapon. It's just a tool that we use when we need some air. Always maintain tires at the maker's suggested pneumatic pressure. Hey, it's Rob Rowe and the Cycle Disciple. I'm here to tell you that it's 4.30 in the morning on a Sunday morning. If you're wondering why I got up this early this morning, it's for you, faithful watchers of Bike TV. Actually, I got up this morning to show you a little bit about how fun and challenging it is to be a collegiate cycling rider. Today, we're going to Jersey with the Columbia University cycling team. But before we pack up and go, there are a few things you need to know about how challenging and fun it is to be one of these intrepid riders. One, college cycling is not an NCAA sport. Columbia's team and all the others are clubs that get the same amount of funding as you and your drinking buddies did. Zero. That's a good news, bad news thing. The bad news is that they only have to raise money from individual alumni, companies, and by hosting races. The good news is that they're not beholden to any of the university's whims or rules. Two, their schedule sucks. And I think I've made that pretty clear already. They train all fall and winter, only to travel and race nearly every weekend during the spring. We'll hear from one of the riders in a minute who will tell you more about that. Three, this is a very, very broad range of skill levels in any one race. The races are broken up into categories, A, B, C, and D. You'll hear some of the riders talk about that today. Some of the people in today's D race will be racing for their first time ever. Some of the people in the A races were junior national and world champions and probably about 10 of them ride for professional teams as their summer jobs. One of those semi-pro riders is Colombia's Vacek Gudicki. Vacek was Poland's second highest rated junior mountain biker before he came to the States, and we'll talk to him in a little while too. 
that these people, four, are usually totally self-directed and organized. I think you'll probably remember how responsible you were in college. Ain't none of that here. These guys set up a meeting every year with the other teams in the conference to agree on rules and race dates, and there's even a national championship. So, we're up, let's go get showered, and we're gonna go see some racing. All right, I'm Jonah Tower. I'm a senior at Columbia University studying computer engineering. This is my first year racing for the Columbia cycling team, and I'm gonna talk about a little bit what it's like to be uh, in the pack, uh, especially in the B category races. Um, so I think, I think what's interesting about the pack and the B category is that it's pretty much just carnage. Uh, there are a lot of strong and incredible athletes there, and they move really fast and are really aggressive but really don't know how to work together. And uh, I think, you know, I, in a 45-minute race, I'm going to get bumped probably a dozen times, and I'll witness oh, I don't know, three or four crashes. And uh, I've been in five races so far and have been crashed out twice, so it's pretty intense. Uh, I was just talking to a guy who said one of his teammates crashed out once, got up, raced again, and then crashed a second time in the same race. Hi, my name is Blair Elephant. I have been riding for just short of a year and uh, the big draw for me with bike racing is that as opposed to a lot of other sports that are extremely individualistic bike racing is all about team strategy like um, this past weekend we hosted a race at Grand's Tomb and one of our riders is a lot stronger than a lot of the other women's riders and so she made a break at which point me and my teammate pulled up to the front of the field and began blocking which pretty much means that we used our weight in front of the field to try to slow down the pack and give our teammate an opportunity to pull off and get as much of a lead as possible so that she could maintain her first place position. Hello, my name is Lux Joshi. I'm uh, the president of the Columbia Cycling Team. I'm a junior and I'm studying electrical engineering at Columbia University. I think the biggest, one of the, hard, the biggest challenges that I have as a student is actually balancing training time with racing and schoolwork. I'm actually taking a very, very heavy load this semester, so it, it puts a very uh, big strain on my training schedule. Moreover, I'm also in charge of team logistics, raising money, that sort of thing, so that's even an, an extra uh, strain on my schedule. So, yeah, really speaking, it's just, it's just a matter of trying to balance. Uh, it's just a balancing act, really. Um, you know, just you got to figure out where you can squeeze in your rides. Um, especially being an undergraduate time, uh, sometimes you, you know you, you might not sleep till two, three in the morning, which makes a 6 a.m. training ride almost impossible to make. Being a club sport at Columbia, it's it's sometimes hard to raise money. We get a bit, we get a little bit of support from the administration, but not nearly the amount of money that we need. So we have to we have to look to corporate sponsorships and alumni donations. Uh, collegiate cycling it's a very spectator friendly sport. Typically, there will be at least 40 schools coming to any the average race and you know countless spectators especially when races are held on campus so you know it's it's a very high exposure sport for companies corporations and in, even individuals <laughs>
what happened in 63 was we started to find out the final plans of the bridge, which actually opened in November of 1964. And in the plans, Robert Moses decided that he was not going to install the, uh, the walkways, um, even though the bridge was designed for it. And he felt that uh, people would be jumping off the bridge, suicides, from the walkways if he built the walkways. And if he didn't build the walkways, well, then we wouldn't have anybody jumping. As it turns out, though, it didn't work because people still jump. Now they drive up, usually during rush hours, dump the car, block traffic, and then jump. The traffic pattern on the Brooklyn side is set up so that there's no traffic coming onto the approach roads from the outside, from 92nd Street all the way up to the bridge anchorages. You could attach a walkway and go completely up the outside of the bridge and never have to cross traffic. Like if, if you go by and look at the uh, Belt Parkway ramps, they come in from the inside. So the Gowanus Expressway goes up, the Belt comes in from the inside and from the left. And you come in on the right side with the walkway and the walkway will just stay on the right side hanging off, cantilevered from the side of the roadway with no interference with the uh, roadway uh, lanes at all. As everybody knows, on any you know, nice day, you get thousands of people here who are walking and running and enjoying this path. This would add, at the minimum, before we even talk about transportation, just the recreation side, would add another two miles of promenade and path and running space and cycling space onto this park complex here. The, the transportation side, though, is really what's also very interesting. Right now, the numbers show about 10% of all the traffic on the Verrazano Bridge has an origin destination of less than eight miles door to door. So that means people starting in Brooklyn, going into Staten Island or back, less than an eight mile trip. And that's 10% of 65 million vehicle crossings, or about six and a half million vehicles a year. If even as little as 1%, one in a hundred of these drivers decide to switch out of a car and onto a bike, we're talking 65,000 trips a year just for that. There's, there's some very good chance that if we keep pushing for it, we might be able to get funding for the bridge. Uh, in the overall scheme of things, $25 million is not a very large amount of money. In fact, it's a ridiculously small amount of money, even in just the MTA's budget, which is on the order of $3 billion a year. The view from the bridge is absolutely stunning, fantastic. Uh, like the Golden Gate looks out over the San Francisco Harbor. Really large numbers of tourists in New York would take the time to come out here and go up and walk on the bridge. Keep them out here for three or four hours extra on their tour to New York. Make, give them something else to find New York exciting and interesting about. And we as a city have just made millions. I watch Bike TV. You're watching Bike TV. I'm watching Bike TV. Bike TV rules. It's probably the best thing that's ever been on television. To avoid heat stroke, be sure to drink some water till you're pissing clear. When you're pissing clear, that's a clear indication that you're hydrated.
What number are you guys up to now? What's the we're, total signature count? We're up over 44,000 at this point. And when do you anticipate going over 50? Uh, the rate we're going probably June. It's absurd, you know? I mean, there's no trees, nothing in New York, and where it is, there are cars. It's disgusting. I run and, and hang out in the park a lot, and I, and I run with a stroller. I have a young son, and I just think the cars are, are dangerous. They don't necessarily see us. They don't cooperate in sharing the road. There's plenty of ways that for, for traffic to, to get around the park. Uh, I just don't see keeping the park open to cars as uh, safe for the people who use it. So why don't you tell Mayor Bloomberg to get the cars out? Since he's done a lot of unpopular things, why doesn't he do this very popular? That's uh, that's a huge mystery. This would uh, uh, there's a handful of people that are actually using the park to drive through, and thousands and thousands of park users who are already on record uh, wanting the cars out. And this would, for one thing, it would save the city money because it's costing uh, thousands and thousands of dollars a year to open and close the entrances to the park. Thanks a lot. And um, quality of life improvement. I mean, where can we find something that would cost nothing, would actually save money, and would vastly improve the quality of life for New Yorkers? This is, uh, this is one of those things, and we shouldn't pass up the opportunity. Seriously reckless drivers, they drive too fast, and these SUVs are very, very scary. Very scary, these guys go around here, when it's raining, they're doing 50 miles an hour, some of these guys. I in the park 15 years now, and every time I see a car in the park, I get frightened, you know? Yeah. Especially with kids and things passing by, you know? We almost got run over back there by um, some calves when they were about the four or five joggers, some rollerbladers, and a cyclist all mixed into that little uh, recreation lane. I think that it's a park, and park is recreation, and not for uh, taking shortcuts, uh, supposed shortcuts uh, through traffic. And I think that uh, the city already has too many cars, and they have the run of the whole city. And this is one place that uh, pedestrians and bicyclists really have to their own. We've come out here with a radar gun and, and uh, clocked the cars at an average uh, in the mornings of uh, 38, 40 miles an hour. Speed limit here is 30. Um, and uh, it's just, you know, obviously it's just an accident waiting to happen. It's just dangerous and unnecessary, and it pollutes the air even if you're not riding and you're walking, you're hanging out with your kids. In Norway we have a lot of wilderness, so I think when New Yorkers have a park like this, it should be for the pedestrians. The way these guys drive, they don't care, they'll just whiz right past you within an inch. You say you want cars to leave the park? I want cars to leave the park. Yeah. <laughs> we need an escape from the city at times. It is the place to go with the cars, they're constantly haunting us and allowing us to have uh, the space we need as human beings. A car is taking up three lanes while bikers get, I think, half of a lane, and there are way more people biking than driving, and it's not fair just to squeeze this this supposed small, major small minority, which is actually a majority, into half of a lane. The police department is responsible for closing the entrances at 7 o'clock, promptly at 7, and we've uh, perennially had a problem with uh, the entrances getting closed on time and there are often uh, cars still in the park at quarter to eight and uh, that's an extremely hazardous situation because you have people ex not expecting cars in the park and all of a sudden they appear and sometimes they're going 35, 40 miles an hour. So we're going to be working again with the uh, Central Park Precinct this year to uh, uh, try to uh, get them to close the entrances on time. How about enforcement? They don't ever seem, they just, t if they see a car and they just kind of kick it out even though the car knows it's not supposed to be here. Right, right. Uh, I, occasionally I've seen them ticket a car, but uh, there's very little enforcement and, and almost no enforcement of speeding because believe it or not, the Central Park Precinct doesn't own a radar gun. Um, they have to re rely on the highway patrol. I ride here every morning, compete with cars all the time. There's just no need for them to be here. I do take walks during the day in winter when there are cars and it's not that nice. It's not only dangerous, it's just bad air, bad sound, bad view. It just destroys the park. Uh, although I'm a car owner, I think it's very important to have an area such as the park free of cars. I think the park is for people and I think the streets are for cars. Another reason that uh, Mayor Bloomberg should be uh, very interested in closing the uh, park to cars is that he's already expressed concern about the lungs of people in the city. Uh, we have the smoking ban in bars, um, and the American Lung Association issued a statement uh, a couple of months ago supporting our campaign and saying that exercising next to traffic in the park is hazardous to your health. And uh, so we have people trying to get away from the city, trying to go to a place that was designed 
to be a place that they could get away from the city and exercise uh, in a healthy and uh, um, way. And uh, and what's actually happening is they're being exposed to hazardous pollutants. I think it's really lame that they even allow cars through there in the first place. I just want my park back, and I don't want to feel the stress of riding through the park with cars approaching me from behind. It's the most. It's one of the most horrendous things I experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Just to show that we're not we're reasonable, we're willing to uh, compromise uh, in the short term, and one of the things that we're uh, looking to get are, are the uh, closing of some extremely little-used entrances to the park. Um, on the west side, there are four of them, uh, West 67th Street, West uh, 85th Street, West 90th Street, and West 100th Street, and on the east side, East 102nd Street. Each of these entrances gets on average during rush hour of a car every minute or a car every two minutes. Um, it's just absurd to, uh, to have these entrances uh, still open and they could be reclaimed for park use and it would be a wonderful gesture uh, and just another signal that uh, we're moving in the direction of getting a completed park repo.